research oh, yeah. and graduate school applications. Yeah, this is career coach 101 here. Yeah. This is like, you were, you were in it. It's important yeah. to, to know that uh -huh. you can use those skills and not only use those, but a tip is that you can put that on your resume. So having that connection to, to yourself Hello and welcome to Career View Mirror. I'm your host, Joelle Crawford, and today's very special guest is Andrea Maurer. She's a human resources professional, published author, speaker, and performer, and fellow gargoyle lover. Her book, <laughs> Boss and Hunky, The Adventures of an Out-of-Work Gargoyle, can be found on Amazon and Nook. Welcome, 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 Andrea. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you here. Andrea and I met many moons ago at a Meet the Author event um, in the city in Phil We're out of side of it. I'm outside of Philadelphia. So for those who don't know where I'm from after listening for so many years, it was in the city. I call the city Philadelphia. And um, I was taken aback by how not only the awesomeness of your book, but I just love your energy and spirit. You know, some HR professionals can be a little bit buttoned up and yeah. a little bit yeah. tight uh, with, with expression <laughs> um, and, you know, no shade to my age, my fellow HR professionals, but no, I just I love, what you mean. I just let, I love how you just live out loud. And yes. so I'm yes. so glad to have you on the podcast so that you can continue to share how you live out loud with our audience. And so I'm what a, I'm a what you see is what you get. Yeah, and you know what? It's very rare that we see that lately, you know, <laughs> transparency and authenticity. It's it's uh why do you think people are challenged with with being authentic and being what you see is what you get these I days? Think I would answer this question different five years ago. It would talk about more like confidence mm -hmm. or lack thereof. But I think right now people are, are just too careful because they're afraid by being authentic, they may offend someone. So I think people are more um, conscious of that right now. So they're really getting to be more afraid to, to live out loud, especially if maybe their views aren't the popular views of the moment. But, you know, as an HR professional, sometimes we, we step in when people are living a little too loudly um, in, in unprofessional situations, you know, um, where living out loud doesn't really follow the norms and values of the organization. Um, you know, a lot of leaders always complain, well, we can't live out loud because everything's PC and we can't say what we need to say. What kind of advice would you give to, to those folks? I would say that as long as you're treating any situation with dignity and respect, you shouldn't have the fear. The, the fear of being PC is to me an excuse for, for not being bold or daring. But as mm -hmm. long as you approach it in a respectful way, and, it, and it, that's what it's really all about. Mm -hmm. We don't always have to agree on everything. We don't always have to see eye to eye, but if we can't continue to have the conversation, or mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes at the end of the day, it may be one of those, look, we're, we're going to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. if we can't even get to that conversation anymore. Um, that's, that's a sad reflection on, on society. So, and I also find that people usually, if they are becoming disrespectful or taking advantage of a situation, they, they already know it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And when I do have to have those difficult conversations, they say, yeah, Andrea, I know I went, I went a little too far. And then I usually try to role play with them a little bit so they can handle it differently the next time. Yeah. So it's almost like you already know what you know, but sure. if, you, if you are able to handle things with dignity and respect, it takes you a lot farther. Absolutely. Then, then you can't around. say to people, I don't mean to offend, but or take no disrespect because at least for me, that sets me up for here comes the disrespect. Right. Bracing yourself. So if you have to, you know, what I call um, negatively prime me to receive the information, I know I'm not going to like it. So instead of making these statements, it's to me, it's almost like a pet peeve. 
when someone says, can I ask you a question? I always think, well, you just did. Well, you, just did. <laughs> you don't have to prepare me. You can ask the question and I can answer it, or maybe I won't answer it or I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just dignity and respect doesn't say, no, I mean this with the utmost respect. It's like, I don't think you do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just, just be direct and thoughtful. That's all. Yeah. I, I yeah. totally agree with you there. So, I mean, speaking of being direct and thoughtful, because I know that I, you just really, I, I, like I told you, like you just light up the room. What experience, <laughs> what experience inspired you to get into human resources? You want the truth, right? Because oh. this is your podcast. Yes. I fell into human resources many, many years ago. I graduated mm -hmm. from the University of the Arts with a really useful degree in theater. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm kidding because it has been useful, but yeah. obviously like 98% of the people who graduated with a theater degree, uh, no work. So the administrative assistant to the director of the theater department said that the personnel department, which is what it was called at the time, yes. needed a temporary secretary. And Andrea, well, she's flaky, but she can type. There you go. So my mom taught me in, in high school to type because she mm -hmm. said it's always a good fallback mm -hmm. on a typewriter. So flaky, but type went in there and got the temporary job, which led to the full-time job, which led to the administrative assistant job, which led to their youngest ever benefits coordinator job. So the position that I fell into, I wound up being in it for four years. Wow. And I had fantastic supervisors who were fun, independent women that I, you know, never experienced those type of business women before. And I just stayed in it. And I, I learned early on, you do not join HR to make people happy. Indeed. That's not the reason that's, you know, go into something else. So that's what really started me in HR. It found me and I've really loved it ever since. That's fantastic. I love that story because, you know, the whole premise of career view mirror is that, you know, I, I ask guests to look out on their past so that others can pave their future. Right. And it doesn't necessarily mean that what you major in is like, your life sentence. Yes, it would be great that we all got roles. And, you know, yeah. I was a theater minor because my parents didn't want me to major in theater because they didn't <laughs> want me to have fun for, for, for a profession. They didn't want me to get paid to have fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I majored in psychology instead and thought right. I was going to be a career counselor for high school students, like a, a guidance counselor. But I'm a more of a guidance counselor for adults, you know, yes, all you are. Yes. I'm into the thing, but yes. you can also leverage the things that you learned in your major as, you know, in the role that you have right now. My whole life, my whole life. I mean, I was very lucky to go to college. I, I graduated from high school in 1984, graduated from college in 1988. And believe it or not, listeners, not everybody went to college. Right. I was the um, first person in my immediate family to graduate from college. Wow. It was a big deal. So my parents literally did not care what major it was. And I only interviewed and auditioned for one school. And I thought I only had one shot to go to a place where I felt like I belonged. Mm -hmm. And the theater director who was wonderful Walter Dallas mm. may he rest in peace mm. he took a chance on me and ironically at my interview slash audition for college he said if you couldn't be an actress what would you want to be and I said I want to be a writer so Isn't that fantastic and that was at 17 years old so but but theater you know it it it's like anything else, like dance, like music. It makes you disciplined. It makes you um, presentable. You know, when you when when people are falling apart around you, you can you can maintain your your composure. And quite frankly, if you have maybe crazy recruitment experiences or interviews with candidates, and you just want to maybe laugh, or you you don't. 
You yes. Don't. You, take, you take everything very seriously, no matter mm -hmm. what comes your way. Uh, uh, interviewees bring in parents to their interviews and and people, you know, eating their breakfast during the interview and 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 stuff like that over the years and and taking calls during the interview. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so you know that 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 theater degree that my parents worked very hard to get really came in handy. And just to have that creative edge yeah. to everything you do, which you understand. I totally understand. Yes. Totally yes. understand. And, and I think it's a, it's a great, they're all transferable skills to draw on. So yes. whatever you have done can be, you know, transferred into whatever you are doing and that's in stone. I mean, look at this. Yes. You, you now wrote a book, which is now a great segue into boss and hunky. How did, how did that story come about? How did wow, you this, get into this, writing this fabulous book? This, this is, um, a really, well, at least to me, it's an interesting story. My husband and I were on the beach in Brigantine, New Jersey, which is about three to six miles away from Atlantic City, um, South Jersey. And there's this old building on the beach that used to be called the Brigantine Inn. Now it's Legacy Resorts, but it is Art Deco 1920s looming over the beach, has never I can't imagine a time it was, wasn't there for, you know, I remember it throughout my whole childhood. And I was just looking up at the top of the building and I thought, hmm, what, what happens to gargoyles if their building is torn down? Because I always thought it screamed for gargoyles, but it doesn't <laughs> have any. And my husband said, why don't you write about it? And I went, oh, why don't I? So I started to write Boston Hunky like a children's play. So the dialogue in the beginning between Boss and Hunky when they find out that their building is going to be torn down the next day was dialogue for a play. And then I thought, well, let me turn it into a children's book, but not a, not a baby book where there's pictures on every page, not right. a little children's book, but maybe more of a young reader. Mm -hmm. And then as I was going through it, my HR stuff started coming out. Not, not only the theater stuff with the subtext of almost everything that's written, but the, the, the HR point of view. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have chapter questions. I mean, my editor thought of chapter questions after each chapter, which I thought was brilliant instead yes. of the back of the book where you're flipping back and forth. Um, and they're they're related to adults or students but but mostly for for adults in business so it's a young readers book and it's a business parable book as well but that's i just just thought of it just like hmm, i wonder what and i think it's important to talk about uh career journeys and what people actually go through even if it is with a gargoyle <laughs> i think it's a great illustration of of you know, um, it's relatable because you do it, the, the the wildest things. You're just like, wonder what would happen, and it and it can really relate to the stories that that um, are illustrated in the book and the illustrations, by the way, which are fantastic. The, the illustrations um, are fantastic. Robert Bond graduated from the University of the Arts about 31 years after I did, mm -hmm. and I found him on the alumni site and said, I need an artist and he read the book and he was able to unbelievably capture everything that I could not draw. I, yeah. I gave him very little direction. I think maybe asked him to add some eyelashes to boss who's the female gargoyle. Um, other than that, he just he just could capture it. He's an animator by trade. Oh, well, that's that's perfect. Yeah. But he he does illustration as well, and they just they're cute, aren't they? They are. They're adorable. <laughs> are there any and are there any more adventures that they're going to have? I mean, is this yes, yes. And my one of my cousins encouraged me because she remembers when her three children were growing up. She said, you can't have a young reader book without a sequel or a next chapter. She said they love going and, and getting the next one. So uh, now Boston Hunky, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing it, but I've been, uh, you know, struggling a little bit because it's kind of mm -hmm. like that, ooh, sequel 
itis, I guess. The, yes, the, the, the yes, pressure. Good. Um, but uh, they um, they encounter a doorstop who lives in their home named Darcy. So this is Boss and Hunky, um, the case of the despondent doorstop. So this next book is about being taken for granted. Ooh. Um, and being ignored. And a, a doorstop, you just, when's the last time somebody looked at their doorstop? So she's a little uh, Boston Terrier, which is a very <laughs> popular doorstop from many years ago. Yes. So, you know, the whole, the whole gang is back for the story. Uh, Darcy's the new character. Uh, Don the Pigeon, um, he's, he's back yet again. And um, the, the butler, Morton, there's, um, he has more of a role in this this time. And, mm -hmm. and Walter has a little bit less of a role. So it's, it's, it's getting there. But each book is going to have one of those life lessons. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I love it. And, and, and now, of course, the theatrical part in me is like, are you going to put this on audiobook? <laughs> and to put your voice acting to the test. I actually was, was thinking about um, audio book and I do have some other friends in the industry and I, uh, you know, I have someone very specific in mind for that Don voice because that's, that's the most fun voice to do. He's just a hoot. <laughs> um, I don't know if I would be boss myself. I do have some, some friends I can reach out to, but I think it, it would be a fun listen for someone yeah. to bring it to life. So there's there's so many ways it can go. And then of course, you know, I have this other thing called a full-time job that, you know, sometimes gets in the way, <laughs> uh, but, I'll, but I'll get there, I'll get there. How do you find the time, speaking of that, of um, about about getting the, the time to do what you love to do um, and, from work and writing so you're, you're sharing both loves that's that's not easy um as you can imagine being being busy and uh, you know having family and friends and different things going on but one thing I'm disciplined about every day I wake up I have my tea this is my second I have to have my tea I have to read my devotions and I have to journal Mm. So every day I'm writing. And then if there's an idea about something specific, I make a notation and I go and I go back to it. And I always walk around with pen and paper. Um, I have to write it down first on, you know, I have to write it in my hand and then I transfer it to, you know, tablet or computer or something like mm -hmm. that. So my morning ritual is really important to me. Mm -hmm. My devotions are extremely important to me. I, I have to start my day that way um it's you know it's it's probably number one followed by number two which is nutrition rest mm -hmm. and finally exercise i'm finally getting exercise and I, i've noticed now that i'm riding a bike outside not a sta i tried the stationary bike thing can't do it i you can't, can't do it okay i can't be embarrassed in a class full of women who can go 90 miles an hour and i can barely lift myself off the seat so as I'm riding my bike, that's when I really start thinking about my ideas. Oh, well, that's even, that's even more interesting. I get in a zone. Yeah. I just hope I don't hit anybody or, <laughs> you know, run over, run over anything on the trail, but you know, cause I get in that zone now. That's great. So what would be one career tip that you would have given to the younger you? The younger me? Yes. Oh my goodness. Um, the younger me in, in general, even not just career is don't be so hard on yourself. Ooh. Um, you know, you'll get there. You will get there and, and patience, practice patience. And that's not just me. That's probably every coach, yes. every boss, every person I've ever known has told me be patient and I'm, I'm getting there, but I still am a little impatient. I am naturally impatient because mm -hmm. I was born three months early. So at two oh. pounds, 10 ounces, I'm like, I got things. You are. To, yeah, I'm completely naturally impatient. So, yes. but I love the don't be so hard on yourself because, yeah. and you will get there is so important because I'm always feeling yeah. like I'm behind, like I'm out of time. Yeah. And for people now, I would say network, join groups. 
common interests, like in mm -hmm. HR, I'm a member of some HR groups, I'm a member of the national firm, which I'm sure you are as well. Yep. But um, it's, it's, it's networking and meeting people. You have to put yourself out there. Even yeah. if you're at an event, doesn't mean you need to work the whole room. Maybe you don't have that salesperson type of personality, but if you can have some meeting, meaningful conversations and always follow up afterwards, yes. meet someone, try to link in with them. If you don't have a business card, you know, say, hey, can you put your number in my phone? Something like that. Maybe one out of 10 people will get back to you. But you know, when the four of us did that author event in March, yeah. Yeah. everybody got back to me, all yeah. three of you authors got back to me and I follow you all on LinkedIn and, and you know, champion things that people are doing. Absolutely. Thumbs up to everybody. Everybody. There's room you know, for success for everyone. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. And the uh, people miss the mark on networking when they don't follow up. And yes. um, I like to make it a game. Like I like to see how many, it's almost like a gamification. Like how many people can I connect with mm -hmm. before the end of the evening and I'll make it a goal. Like I yeah. want to connect with at least three people this evening um, before I leave this event or this virtual event. Cause you can still network yes. with people virtually too. Yes. You know, I know things are still you slow. Get it? You just start with something easy. Like, Hey, I like your scarf. Oh, I like your whatever, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And you just, you just start going. And I like those networking events where they make it a game. Like you know, find, find the person, you know, in, in the black blazer or find the person yeah. you up in Philadelphia and, and you have a little, and you get around to everybody and yeah. maybe there's a, a prize at the end because incentives are great for everybody. But yeah. I do feel bad for people who aren't, you know, able to do that. Right. Um, so I may gravitate towards the person sitting in the corner, mm -hmm. and sit down in the corner with them and Oh, you're having a nice evening and, and, and that kind of thing. Or they may be sitting just because, you know, not everybody can stand for two hours. Absolutely. Um, so I do like to meet people that way as well. And then maybe I'm the only person they met that night, but Indeed. maybe I could do something for them. I don't know. I, and that's the other thing, you know, I, I talk about this in my book is about setting the intention of collaboration and support, like whatever you're interacting with a human being, mm -hmm. whether it's networking or giving feedback, if you set that intention of collaboration and support, you're going to attract, you know, good things. And so you going over to that other person is setting that intention of collaboration and support, like, hey, maybe, you, you know, maybe it's not comfortable for you to be work in the room and everything. Yeah. I'm going to come to you and, and, and assist and see how I can support you. And you're right. It, you could be the one person in the room that, um, that they speak to, but that, that connection could result in some amazing synergies. You never know. So I also like to, and my husband laughed the other day, cause I like to do one nice thing for a person a day, but he says, that's it. That's all you have in you. One nice thing. I'm like, no, I, I mean, <laughs> well, sometimes in HR now yeah. but I mean for a stranger, like a complete yes. and utter stranger. Like if I'm at the supermarket and someone's in front of me and they're struggling to reach into the front of their cart to get something, I'll just pick it up and put it on the thing. Mm -hmm. Or I was at Wawa last week and there was a gentleman, older gentleman talking to a young lady about, um, something he learned at church and you know he was preaching to her in a way and I walked by and I just said what he's saying is absolutely correct you know believe him and and he was just like thank you or like those kind of things mm -hmm. or giving someone a compliment or asking them if they're they're having a good day uh because you just never know what kind of day so that's what I mean right. one nice thing a day right for somebody you absolutely don't know. So if I'm on LinkedIn, hey, congratulations on your promotion. And they're a second connection and I never right. saw them before. Right. Why not? Why not boost somebody up? Exactly. Who doesn't like a congratulations or a yeah. thumbs up? Not, or something? not many people are confident. They, they don't, you know, whether it's upbringing or whether whatever's happened in their, their lives, um, what happens to us during our youth? 
carries with us our entire lives. Mm -hmm. So if you weren't given that foundation of being confident, it's really hard to build as it is. It really is. It really is. And you know what? It doesn't cost anything to share your shine with somebody, you know, and just brighten their day a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree, Andrea. Well, I appreciate you being here and all of the gems that you dropped. And I can't wait to read the the newest and next adventures of Boss and Punky. I will put all of Andrea's information in the comments. If you've liked what you've heard and seen, please subscribe and share with your friends. And thanks again for joining us on Career View Mirror. See you next time.